It's wonderful to see uh, folks here, and um, and we know that, that some are worshiping with us online, and, and we appreciate and welcome that, and the Spirit of the Lord, I'm sure, will be there as well. And I do uh, need to announce that um, Pastor Brandt received a positive test for COVID yesterday, so he is not here. Um, and we are thankful to Rob Wilhoff stepping in, and we'll be bringing the message, and Sandy Partridge also helping uh, with the service today. And we're very delighted to have uh, Krista and David back with us and uh, while the Snells are on vacation. So um, let us start with a call to worship, a responsive reading from Revelation. And I ask you to stand, please, and it will be um, on the front. And it's pretty clearly marked as a leader and people, and you're the people. <laughs> so let us begin from Revelation. Um, then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. Let us pray. Lord God, we too join with all creation to give you power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. May our praise be acceptable to you today. May our worship be a time when you move with your Holy Spirit, and we pray for Pastor Brant, and we pray for our congregation and all of our, our loved ones, and we just thank you that we can come together in your name, in the precious name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So this morning we're going to be starting with uh, victory in Jesus, and I wanted to share Deuteronomy 24. Um, ooh, my phone. It says, for the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. And we're all going through stuff, right? <laughs> um, maybe, it's, maybe you're just coming out of something hard or maybe you're about to go through something hard. But I just wanted to just remind you that God is for you. And um, if we partner with him, he will bring us victory um, through whatever we're going through. So let's claim it this morning as we sing victory in Jesus.
never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see that you're working possibly can, whether it's in word, it's in song, it's in, it's in thought, it's in deed, it's in our hearts, God, that we would be able to exalt you on your throne, that each morning we could come before you, Lord, and find deep, deep intimacy, God, rescue our hearts from all of the false lovers of this life, help us to recognize the way that you are the true miracle worker, not only with just circumstances in life, but ultimately with completely remaking our hearts, God. And I ask for that reality to be in my life and in each one of our lives here, God, that you would allow us to walk in that, in truth and reality, that we would not just you know, so to speak, talk the talk, but that we would live and experience a, a deeper life with you that, that we always thought was possible, we hear people talk about, but give us that, that true intimacy in our own lives, God. And I pray that your glory through that and your love would be shown, we've been demonstrated to other people because that is what will draw them unto you, is that deep, centered relationship on you where nothing can shake us. And granted, sanctification is lifelong. But I pray that each, each day that we're closer to you, each day that we're, we're representing that even more, and that we'd be able to share your lifeline, God, with those around us, even just through our countenance. So this morning, we just give you all the glory once more, and the praise of you would move through this service, that this uh, the message would just carry through to our hearts and to those around us and that you would allow us to release all of our fears and worries on you and trust in your providence and in your 
provision, God. And I pray for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. everything settled again. <laughs> um, just a normal announcement that's up there about the offering. You can uh, mail it in, you can put it in the boxes, the white boxes, or you can do it online. Um, we have a couple of um, items on the prayer list. Uh, Dan Patmore, um, that's Pam's husband, is at Strong with an undiagnosed illness awaiting uh, test results. And Cheryl Harris has a praise that the scar tissue um, removed from her eye was um, a successful surgery. That's wonderful. Okay, our scripture for this morning for the prayer time is Matthew 28, verses 1 through 15. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Let us pray. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for today, um, for waking up to the sun um, and uh, the beautiful flowers that you send. After the rains come, Lord, there's a blessing in nature. We, um, we experience the dull, dark days filled with rain, and uh, at the end of it, we're able to see your promise through um, the beautiful spring. Lord, we bring our, um, our prayers to you, uh, specifically uh, for um, Dan Patmore, we ask that you will give guidance and wisdom to the doctors as they try and figure out what's wrong with him. And Lord, we pray that you will um, work healing his body. We pray also for Pam that you will give her peace and comfort as she, uh, she waits through this time. And we think of Cheryl and her praise, and we are so grateful, Lord, that you have um, worked in her eyes and... Um, have continued to make progress with her sight, Lord. We are so thankful for the miracle that you have done in Cheryl's life. Lord, we lift up all the people that we have been praying right along for, um, and, and you know exactly where they are in their journey and their struggles and their illnesses. We ask that um, you will stay close to them, that you will bring other people close to them to um, help in your healing process and to bring your peace and comfort. We ask um, especially for uh, healing for Pastor Brandt, 
Um, we ask that, um, this, that he will have mild symptoms of COVID and um, no lingering effects, Lord. We uh, also ask that you will keep the rest of his family safe, that um, they won't get sick. And uh, Lord, that, that we will be here to help in whatever way that you want us to help that family, Lord. Lord, we, um, we also um, ask for, for your guidance and uh, comfort and peace in our country and in the world, Lord. There is so much going on, and we have heard and sung about um, do not fear, um, look to you, and Lord, we ask that, uh, that we will continue to do that and that we will um, continue to show kindness and witness to, to those in our community and those that we come into contact every day, Lord. Lord, we lift up all these prayers to you, knowing, um, having that sure hope that you love us and uh, you are looking out for us, and Lord, in your will, um, all will be accomplished as you, as you wish it to be, Lord. We pray all of this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
Thank you, um, David and Krista, and for Greg and Sandy and others who are filling in in places that um, are different for us. So, um, Kristen has um, been singing Easter songs not on Easter, and nobody's reported her. So I decided that it was all right to preach from the Easter story, not on Easter. So that's what we're going to do. Some of these thoughts, actually, uh, I started with back on Easter Sunday morning, and they've sort of been gelling. Uh, so when uh, Pastor Brandt said, can you fill in, I decided to try to meld some of these ideas together. Uh, we're going to be looking mostly at scripture this morning. We're going to be reading a lot of scripture. God promises that it's his word that will not come back void. So I figure the more of his word and the less of my words, probably the better. So um, we're going to read a lot of the Easter story from several uh, different um, uh, scriptures, uh, different gospels. And we're going to look at, we're going to meet seven people. And... Um, some of them are groups of people, some of them are individuals, uh, but we're going to see the guards, we're going to look at the chief priest, we're going to look at Mary, the disciples who met him on the Emmaus Road, Peter and Thomas, and a surprise one at the end. I'm not going to give away everything at the beginning here. Each one of these stories is different, each one of these people who met the Lord had a different response, uh, but um, I think each of them have a message for us today. Let's pray before we begin. Dear Heavenly Father, I just ask as we uh, look at your word this morning, as we consider the resurrection of your son and um, the things that he has done for us, we just ask that you will uh, make this uh, truth new in our lives, and that it will change our lives as we go from this place. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, the first two people that we're going to look at, you've already met in the, um, in the passage that, um, uh, that Sandy read this morning. Um, and it's interesting, these first two groups of people Jesus did not, oops, I'm sorry, I should have taken this off. I'm so used to teaching in this that it's become like part of my body. <laughs> sorry, that will probably help too with uh, being able to hear. Um, sorry about that. The first two groups of people you've actually met already. And um, most likely Jesus did not interact with either of these two groups of people after the resurrection. But there's a good likelihood that he interacted with them before. In fact, with the, in the part of the chief priest, we know that he did. Uh, with the soldiers or the guards, not quite so sure about that. Um, the chief priests have been opposing Jesus since the time that he started his ministry. It was almost word number one, and the chief priests the teachers of the law, the people who should have accepted him the most, are fighting against him the whole time. Uh, Jesus has some of his most critical words. In fact, I haven't actually studied this, but I would say probably his only critical words about the teachers of the law, the Pharisees. Um, he said, you're blind guides, reading, leading the blind. You're whitewashed graves uh, that just have dead man's bones in them. Uh, he likened them to the ones who killed the prophets. These were serious accusations. And Jesus reserved them only for these people who should have been the leaders in the church, should have been those the first to accept him. Uh, these men knew the truth, but they had rejected it. And they continued to reject it. So what do we see them doing? They're not convinced by the resurrection. Jesus said, 
even if somebody comes back from the dead, they will not believe. And they didn't. So what do they do? They come up with a plan to cover this up. Okay, the guards. The guards were most likely Roman. Scripture doesn't say that, but it's, it's probably the case that they were Roman. And so I put them in the, in the category of the secular. Right? They, they didn't really have an interest in this. All they really cared about is they didn't want to get in trouble. Right? So what did they do? They take the money and run. Right? They spread the word. They tell the lies that the chief priest said to tell. And, but they're just going to continue and say, you know what, this Jesus fellow, he doesn't have anything to do with me. Just let me live my life. Just let me get my money. Let, just let me live in safety. I don't want Jesus. He just messes things up. Okay, let's turn to John, the 20th chapter. And um, we've already heard about Mary, but John gives a much fuller account of Mary at the, um, at the tomb. So we'll pick up in, um, in verse number 11, and um, John writes here, But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken away my Lord, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't recognize it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not returned to the Father. Go instead and tell my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. Scripture, at least that I could find, only tells us three people that weep, that wept in the Gospels, right? Other parts of Scripture, there's lots of other people. As far as the Gospels go, there's only three. Peter, who we'll look at in just a minute. Jesus, twice. He wept over Jerusalem, and he wept at the tomb of Lazarus. And Mary here who wept at the tomb of Jesus. And I think it's interesting, John, who is, I don't want this to be a negative term, the sentimental writer of the Gospels, is the one who records the two weepings at the tomb. Jesus weeping at the tomb of Lazarus and Mary weeping at Jesus' tomb. Jesus told a parable. And he said, these two guys came and... Neither of them could pay their debts. And he said, you're forgiven. One of them owed him 50 bucks, let's say. The other owed him $50,000. Jesus said to Simon, whose house he was at, who do you think loved him more? And Simon says, the one who he forgave more. Jesus said, yep, got that one right. Didn't get much else right tonight, but you got that one right. And then he said, those who have been forgiven much, love much. I think that there's at least some good evidence. Scripture doesn't say this, but I think there's at least some good evidence that the woman who broke the perfume and was washing Jesus' feet 
was Mary Magdalene. And she had been forgiven much. And she was there, and she was in distress. Because this person who she loved so dearly was gone. She didn't understand what had happened. She was weeping. She had no clue what to do. She was so distraught, she didn't even recognize Jesus. Turned around, saw him, was conversing with him, and didn't even recognize him. And Jesus said just one word. And I wonder whether he had said this same word to her. And I know I'm going extra scripture here, so don't put too much weight in this. But I wonder if he had said her name when she was anointing his feet. And this just brought it all back. And she recognized that she had come to mourn, and all of a sudden she's filled with joy. She was weeping alone, and now she's clinging to the feet of Jesus and saying, don't leave me. Jesus said, I need to leave you, but I'm still with you. Okay. Group number four, the disciples on the Emmaus Road. Scripture makes it hard sometimes to piece things together in chronology. Jewish writers just weren't, they didn't care about it. It wasn't really important, the, se the sequence that things happened in. But it's likely these were the first disciples to see Jesus alive. I love these guys. You probably, some of you are already guessing why I love these guys. These guys were just a little cynical right? The women had come, the women had said, we saw him, we saw him alive. Peter and John have gone to the tomb, found the tomb empty, all the evidence is there, and these two guys are going, mm, not sure, not sure about this. I'm right there with them, okay? They thought they knew, Jesus comes along, and what did they do? They began to tell him everything that had gone on. They knew it all, but they didn't. Okay? And what were they doing as they were going along? They were discussing. Right? Those of us who teach professors, as we're called sometimes, we love to discuss. Right? These guys love to discuss. They're talking, they're going to figure it out. And Jesus comes along. And he starts right where they were. He didn't say, hey, I'm here to tell you the right stuff. He says, huh, what's going on? Let's them tell their story. He spent time with them. He walked probably a good distance. He ate with them, at least a good deal of a meal. Uh, he opened scripture to them. And this is, of course, what's so cool about this story is that it's scripture that shows them who Jesus is. It was all there. They just needed to understand. They needed to have their eyes opened and their hearts burn within them, as it says. Uh, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. I should have read the story. Uh, I'm just not used to this. Luke 24, the slide's probably been up there for a week now. Um, now, on the same day, two of them were going to the village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and was walking along with them but they were kept from recognizing him. <clears throat> Excuse me. He asked them, what were you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked, asked him, are you the on only a visitor in Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened in these days? What things? He, I love that question, what things? About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and the rulers handed them over to be sentenced to death, 
and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us what they had seen, a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just the way the women had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are, how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if, they were going, as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in and stayed with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while we talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? So, sorry, you heard all the, all the important points from that before. Uh, I did have one more thing I wanted to uh, mention here. Um, this is the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther and his great defense at the uh, Diet of Worms. And some of you might have noticed the quote from Luther. I don't usually put quotes except for scripture up on the slides. Uh, but Luther says, unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures and by clear reason, I am bound by the scripture I've quoted. And I love this phrase, my conscience is held captive by the word of God. This was what those disciples saw there. They saw, the word, they saw the word of God. They saw scripture opened up to them. And that was what gave them the assurance. Um, and of course, God, uh, Luther goes on and says, I cannot or will not recant anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience, to go against the word of God. Here I stand, I can do no other. God help me. So 500 years ago, Luther was standing on the word of God. These disciples are standing on the word of God. Okay, Peter. This time I promise I'll read the, the scripture first. Let's go back to John. And um, there's three short passages, all of which are familiar. Uh, but um, we already have seen part of this. Um, Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter. The other disciple, by the way, is John. Um, that's, that's the way John refers to himself, either as the other disciple or the one that Jesus loved. Uh, the other disciple uh, outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, went inside. He saw and believed. I think it's interesting, it doesn't say Peter saw and believed. Um, I don't know, I don't want to be drawing too much there. Then it says of both of them, they still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Okay, and then 19, John, same chapter, 19 through 29. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, the doors locked for fears of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. 
the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you, receive, if you forgive anyone their sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. And uh, finally, we'll come back to the second one there. Uh, finally, John 21, uh, 4 through 19. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable the net, to pull the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, John, said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciple followed in the boat, towing the, note, towing the net of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire burning, uh, burning coals with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said, come, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter uh, climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This now was the third time Jesus appealed to his disciples after he had been raised from the dead. And then the story that we've all heard and are so familiar with. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me, he said. Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone will, lead, will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. I don't know if you realize how much of a parallel this story is. The first time Peter meets the Lord, he's fishing. They fished all night. They haven't caught anything. Jesus comes along on the shore, says, have you caught anything? They said, no. He says, throw it on the other side of the boat. They think to themselves, sorry, this isn't recorded in scripture. This guy's crazy. They throw the net on the other side of the boat. They get so many fish that the nets can't hold it. Twice, same story. And by the way, they both end with the same command, follow me. But this story about the restoration of Peter is just so incredible. Jesus doesn't say you're forgiven. I think Peter knew already that he was forgiven. Jesus had said even before he, he uh, denied him, he said, I'm, I'm praying for you. Satan has, has desired to shift you as wheat, but I am praying for you. So I think Peter knew that he had been forgiven. What Peter needed was to be restored, to be set up for ministry again. And so three times Jesus says, do you love me? Peter says, of course I love you. 
And Jesus says, minister, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Okay, Thomas sort of ignored this part of the story earlier. Just going back a page there probably um, to, um, uh, to John uh, 20. Um, John 20, uh, 26. So um, Thomas wasn't there, of course, the first time. And um, uh, he, uh, he goes on and uh, John writes, a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. That though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand. Put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told them, Because you have... Hold, I'm sorry. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet not believed. And then probably the most important verses of this passage, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not recorded in the book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you may have life in his name. We're way too hard on Thomas. Thomas was no different than the rest of the disciples. He just happened to have missed the first meeting. Never miss meetings, right? right? We all have our doubts. Each of the disciples had their doubts, and they saw the same evidence that Jesus presented to Thomas. So, you know, just, just, like, just like Jesus did to Mary, just like Jesus did to those on the... Emmaus Road, just as he did to the disciples. He starts where Thomas is, and he says, look, see, you were doubting, but see. And then what I think is so interesting, it doesn't say, so Thomas examined the, the wounds, you know, did a fact analysis, and came to the scientific conclusion that Jesus was, in fact, who he said it was. It uses the same word, it's used for the others. He believed. It's ultimately, no matter how much evidence we're given, it's ultimately a matter of faith. It's, and that's why I think that last verse is so important. It says to us, we have the same evidence. We have the same information. We have enough so that we can believe. Okay, our surprise guest, and maybe a few of you have figured this out, um, and as soon as I say the passage, you're all going to figure it out. Let's turn to Acts 9. And it's really important as we start here to think about how this has come full circle. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul. Why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not hear anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord came to him in a vision. Ananias? Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, 
Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm that he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he came here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on his name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry, out, carry my name before the Gentiles, their kings, and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. So I don't know if you caught that full cycle. Remember the first group that we talked about? The chief priests. Paul was working for the chief priests. He was fulfilling this fighting against the word of God. He had clearly and completely and totally rejected the message of Jesus. But God had chosen Paul. This was an immediate, total conversion. There was no doubt about what happened here. And he was told, you're going to proclaim and you're going to suffer. So seven people, those of you who have been in a Bible study with me, no, I like to end our discussion with, so what? Right? So when I titled this sermon, I titled it, The Resurrection, So What? Okay. What so what are you going to take away today? How's the resurrection of Jesus Christ going to affect you? Perhaps you're like the chief priests, and you need to stop fighting his work and accept him. Maybe you've bought into the secular message that, you know, that resurrection thing isn't really that important. Maybe like the guards, you need to understand that Jesus' resurrection is the single most important event of history. And it's much more important than your possessions or your safety. Perhaps you're like Mary and you have hurts that nobody else understands. Jesus is there to say your name. Maybe you're like the disciples on the road. You need a fresh view of God's word. You need to see Jesus in a new way in scripture. Maybe you're like Peter. Maybe you need to be forgiven and restored to ministry. Maybe you're like Thomas. You need to be assured in a new way of what Jesus has done. Or maybe you're like Paul, and you just need God to knock you to the ground and make you ready to do his will. Let's pray. My prayer, Lord, is for each person who's here today and that they might see you as the risen Savior in a new way. I pray wherever we're at, wherever we have gotten off track in our Christian life, that your resurrection will just paint it anew, that we will see the power that we will see the, tr the, the absolute surety of what has happened. And then perhaps just as importantly, that we will let it change our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
quiero. 